Yeah. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Katia for a very kind invitations. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about um, my joint work with Gunther and Yang Yang about an inverse problems for a nonlinear Boltzmann equations. And in the first part of the talk, I will review some results for the inverse problem for linear Boltzmann equations. They are the radiated transfer equations. And I will uh, talk about some problem setup applications and also some key idea to study the inverse problem for the linear Boltzmann equation. And second part of the talk, I will go to our work on the inverse problem for nonlinear Boltzmann equations. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the transport equations. So uh, we consider uh, functions f is the density distributions of particle in the median, and it depends on only the positions and also velocity v. And this satisfy uh, the following transport equations is uh, velocity v in the product with gradient uh, with respect to x. And the second term, uh, there's a sigma f. So sigma, this coefficient is the absorption coefficient. It reflects that the particle might be absorbed by the media during the propagation. And the right-hand side, uh, the qf, it denotes the, as the collision operator. It characterizes how the particle interacts with the media and also with each other. And the specific form of this Q will be discussed uh, later. So um, in some situation when the sigma is zero, um, we can take special form for collision operator, it will be uh, the nonlinear Boltzmann equation I will introduce uh, in my second part of the talk. Okay, so uh, for the radiative transfer equation, it's known as a linear uh, Boltzmann equation. It takes the collision operator uh, as a QF, this operator, and it takes the form as the integral with back to the velocity V point. And there's a coefficient K inside uh, this integral. And this K depends on three variables. One is the position and velocity V point and also velocity V. And this coefficient is the scattering coefficient. It reflects the probability that particle being scattered from V point direction into the V directions, which is the a V appears in this transfer operator. So the RT equations, uh, it takes the form, again, this is a transfer operator plus the sigma F minus this collision operators. So this is the uh, radiative transfer equations. So now if we consider the particle travel in a non-scattering medium, so that means in this medium, there's no scattering effect. Then we consider uh, this collision is equations, meaning that there's no KF, the, uh, the scattering coefficient is zero. So in this case, the particle will only go straight uh, in a straight night in these medians. So uh, uh, if we put a particle here, they will just uh, go straight, uh, uh, follow this dot line here and then hit a boundary. And the velocity due to uh, this collision is, so they will remain as a constant. And during this propagation, once we send in the particle and then receive the particle on the other side, and they will uh, might encounter some particle loss between incoming and outgoing part. And this particle loss will be related to its absorption coefficients. So it might be considered as a loss term at the position X with the velocity V. However, if now we consider a scattering medians. So in a scattering median, the particles uh, his travel trajectory might not simply as a, a straight line, it might encounter several scattering effects before they hit the boundary again, like the picture uh, I put it here. So once it go in, it might encounter several scattering before he hit the boundary again. So this is, uh, we have the scattering uh, operator here. 
we have the k is scattered from initial uh, directions b prong into the b directions. So it can be uh, considered as a gain term at position x with velocity v. So when you have the, uh, the total RT equation, we have this uh, absorption term and also this scattering term. So now what is the uh, data we are taking uh, on, this, uh, on this boundary? Is the uh, so-called orbital operator. So this orbital operator is a map. It maps the incoming uh, particle density to the outgoing particle density. So uh, we take the forms F restricted on the gamma minus to F restricted to gamma plus. So where the gamma minus part is the incoming coordinates. So at position X on the boundary and the velocity V because incoming, so it should be pointing inside the median like we show in this red arrow over here. It's a boundary points and then there's a point inward direction. And then once they propagate through this media and exit uh, at the boundary, then we have some detector outside to pick up the going out particles. And this blue arrow is related to the, uh, the gamma cross part because it's all going. So this boundary measurement in math form red part to, to the, the blue part. So once we have this uh, beta operator, the image province for the stationary RT equation <clears throat> is following. So we have a boundary value province for this RT. We have this equation, we have the boundary data on the incoming part. And the goal is to using this orbital uh, operator for incoming to outgoing measurements uh, to recover two coefficients, a social coefficient and collision kernel, okay. So actually this problem is well posed. If we assume, for example, the absorption rate is much larger than the scattering rate. In that case, uh, the transport operator will be invertible. So one can show that the solution exists uniquely. So once for uh, for work problem uh, works, then we can uh, study the inverse problem. There are several uh, applications related to the setup for the inverse problem for RTE equations. One of application is related to optical tomography. So Optical tomography is the medical modality. It uses the light as a tool uh, to probe the medians. So uh, the purpose is to using the boundary measurement, the incoming to outgoing map to recover the inner optical property like sigma and k, the absorption and scattering. As we see from this picture, and one line is the incoming photon and the other one will be detector. They are roughly a couple centimeters away apart from each other. And they can be used to observe the blood flow and oxygenation uh, so that doctor can see if a patient uh, will have a stroke or head injuries. So this is a, a picture of the head and we have a source on this incoming part. And then we have detector just nearby to pick up the outgoing photon. So from this uh, measurements, we'd like to see the blood flow and oxygenation. Okay, so this is about applications. And there are many uh, results for a stationary RT equation. Uh, my apologize if I didn't include your work here. Um, the list, at least here is definitely not a complete list. So uh, the mechanism is that one have the data and then we want to recover or determine the sigma and k uniquely. And what show uh, by Chori and Stefano in 96 for higher dimensional, they recover uniquely the sigma and k. And for two dimensional case, 
by Stephanie and Oman in 2003, they show both the uniqueness result and also stability estimate. And one can uh, see that the stability estimate for the transport equation from RT here is quite stable compared to the inverse problem for the diffusion equation or the cardinal problems, which we know is uh, quite unstable because it's a logarithmic stability, stability estimate. So uh, for RT pace, the estimate is just the holder time. So it's much stable. <clears throat> and this was considered by Wang in 99 and also by Bo and Julivier. And they are more recent work by, uh, by them as well. Okay, so let me quickly go through the, uh, the key idea uh, discussed by Julie and Stefano. So basically we, we focus the incoming data, the photons on one single position and directions. And we decompose it into three uh, parts, F1, F2, and F3. Where the F1 will satisfy its transport equation but the right hand side there's no collision. And it has the concentration of photon at one position and one direction. And F2 satisfy the same transport operator, but the right hand side, uh, they have this integral KF1. F1 is the, the solution above. So the F1, uh, why we consider it as a ballistic term, because as we saw uh, in the picture, there's no collision term. So this part will basically just go straight, uh, follow the straight line in the median. So it's just a Boris term. And we can use that uh, to recover the sigma. So once sigma is determined, so uh, this is no, then we use F2 term to recover the K as well. And this is due to uh, those functions have different securities. So this is uh, about the uh, quiz review for the inverse problem for linear uh, Boltzmann equations. And second part of my talk, now I will talk about our work on the inverse problem for nonlinear Boltzmann equations. So the same as RT case is we have the transpose uh, operator on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we have slightly different collision operator. So we have QFF. It means that this is the collision operator, takes the form, is the double integral uh, over whole space and also unit sphere. And we have the unknown collision kernel B, depend on three directions B, U, and W. And we have two nonlinear terms. The first term is depend on uh, u point and b point. And second term depend on u and b. So it seems like in this expression, we have six different uh, variables, s uh, and u point, b point, u, v, and w. But actually they are not that many because U prong and V prong, they are connected <coughs> by these two relationships. So that means that U prong, uh, we, once we have U, V, and W, we, we know U prong and V prong, and vice versa. So what are those factors? So our QFF in the Boltzmann equation actually characterize the bin binary interaction. So there's a a two particle, they collide each other. So during the collision, right before the collision, this is called a pre-collision velocity, U and V. And after the collision, we also have the post-collision velocity, U prong and V prong. And the two relationships we just saw from the previous slides, it can be derived by the following two conservation law. The first conservation law is about momentum. So that means the sum of the velocity will preserve during the collision, uh, before and after the collision, and as well as the kinetic energy. 
and from this two conservation law, one can also derive uh, this uh, two identity here. So combine all together, we can derive the U prong B prong uh, relationship. So as we mentioned uh, above, UV is the before collision velocity and U prong V prong is the velocity after it. So suppose we have the particle uh, expressed by this uh, sphere, the ball, and these two particles has the velocity V and U respectively, and they collide over here. And W represent as the uh, collision angle. And after collision, they will have velocity U prong and V prong. So uh, we can also uh, see that from these two relationships, the components of U and V, they will, uh, uh, the component of UV perpendicular to W will be preserved like we uh, see over here, but the component along the W uh, will be interchanged. That's because uh, we just in the product both sides uh, with the W. So to draw this picture, we're just using this uh, U uh, perpendicular to W, so we will have the arrow over here for U prong, but they will interchange for uh, the UV direction. So we have this one and there will be N up over here. So this is how we create the U prong uh, in this direction and send for uh, V prong. Okay, so this is uh, about the collision operator and their, their velocities. So the inverse problem setup is, looks very similar to the RT case. We also consider the boundary uh, value problems so we take a boundary on the incoming part and then using the maps to, to, to measure the outgoing part. So we hope to use this boundary operator A from incoming to outgoing to determine or recover the collision kernel B depend on three direction, incoming two direction and collision angle W. So <clears throat> this is a nonlinear uh, Promise and his real positive can be a uh, promise if we take sufficiently small boundary data. So once the data G is sufficiently small, one can use the uh, fixed point theorem to show the existence of the solutions. So it leads us uh, the the uh, the task to recover uh, the inverse problem only. So now we want to recover the B. This is the goal. So let's take a look at collision operator once more. So this is our collision operator. We have two nonlinear terms. And these two nonlinear terms only looks like quadratic lock. Uh, it's not a quadratic term because it depends on different uh, velocity. Like the first term here, it depends on U prong and B prong. So it's only like a quadratic. So, um, if we try to using the uh, linearization in a classical way, uh, then we, we may, may not reduce this uh, nonlinear Boltzmann equation into the linear equation like the RT case. So that means we cannot use the known result for RT to solve for uh, our problems over here. And this uh, motivates us to consider a different way. So the, the method we apply is the so-called higher order linearizations. So uh, what is the higher order linearizations? Uh, is a method that uses nonlinearity as a tool, not a barrier. It's try to solve the inverse problem for nonlinear equations. The main spirit is to introduce several small parameters into the data and then differentiate with respect to them in order to get a simple uh, linearized equations. There are many words uh, have used this um, method of nonlinearity as a tool to solve the problem. So for instance, the nonlinear hyperbolic equations and nonlinear elliptic equations. Um, I'm sorry if I didn't include your work here. Uh, you can let me know 
so I can put it in, a, in my future talk. Okay, so there are many uh, words, uh, they, they, they use this method to solve for inverse powers. So let's get back to our setting. So uh, with our Q, collision operator has the, uh, the quadratic like linearity. So uh, we introduced uh, two small parameters because it's quadratic like, they have uh, two terms. So uh, the setup we have is we uh, impose this uh, issue one, two, one, plus issue two, G2. G1, G2 uh, is the two fixed continuous incoming data. And each one, each one, two is the small parameter that we can choose freely. So once this uh, data is sufficiently small, uh, the real positive result is, uh, is fine. So now we differentiate respect to each one and each one, two. So during the first annihilation, we differentiate respect to each one and each one, two at zero. So we take the BK is the first differentiation of F at zero. And then during this differentiation, we will only keep the linear part. So that means the only linear part is the transport operator in our setting, it will be preserved, but the nonlinear term in the QF will be at zero. And then we will have the data GK on the boundary. And this was to notify that the, this equation is actually collisionless. So it, it only satisfies this very simple transport operator without any collision terms. And also this term is totally independent of the unknown kernel. This is the very crucial part. It will uh, help us to determine the B later on. How about the second annihilations? We take differentiation with respect to issue one, issue two, and zero. Again, we preserve a linear part, but the QFF originally have two nonlinear terms, but uh, because they have a uh, different velocity, so we will have a four term instead. So why we have that? If we fix the v-point, we take differentiation with respect to each one and each one two. Same for u-point. So we will have the two term in QF now have four term in this source term. And the right hand side is independent of the solution done. It's also quite uh, important. So now we see we didn't uh, include the b in the first annihilation, but now the b appears in the source terms. In particular, those uh, nonlinear term now is just a solution from the first annihilation. Then there are a lot of choice to, to choose because it's independent of B. So this is a, a very important uh, observation. So before uh, we go further, I would like to discuss uh, briefly what is the difference between the quadratic term and our quadratic light collision operator. So for the quadratic term, if we have QF square, this nonlinearity, during the first annihilations, they will also preserve a linear term as expected. However, during the second annihilations, uh, their term here will be very different. They are going to differentiate one F with respect to each one, the other f with back to issue two. So we they have the two q v1 v2. However, as we saw above, in our case, we are going to produce more terms from the two nonlinearity to the four uh, four terms over here. Okay, so how do we uh, recover the b? We know the b appears in the second iteration. So let's start from there. This is a second annihilation questions. And because it has a zero uh, boundary data, one can write down the solution W as the nine integral from zero to the active time. 
and we have S depend uh, on B. So what is this uh, backward axis time? Tau minus is that we have position S and the direction B. And tau minus means that it's the time we need uh, to hit the boundary uh, in the backward. So the W has this uh, nice expressions. So now <clears throat> we haven't used our orbital operator yet, our boundary operator yet. So here it is. So once we uh, differentiate twice uh, on A, actually we will have this uh, form and this is equal to the W restricted on the outgoing part of the second iterations. So this is going to uh, be very crucial to help us to uh, derive the identity. So once we know that, and we also know the W is equal to integral with S. So we have the following key identity in our work. So for any outgoing position and velocity, we uh, have identity, the left hand side is the known data because it's only a differentiation of the boundary operator. And the right hand side, it encodes the uh, to be determined kernels B. So that means that this identity conveys the uh, unknown to the known data. All right. So let me briefly uh, talk about how do we uniquely determine the B under some assumptions on B. And what kind of assumption we need, uh, I, will, I will talk about in a minute. So first, uh, we suppose the data uh, are the same. And from this, we can derive the data, the algorithm data of W will be also the same. Then from the key identity, we can have the zero on the left hand side, but now the right hand side represents the, the source term S by this double integral. So the right hand side now has triple integral with the difference of two kernels times P. And the P is simply the four uh, terms only depend on V1 and V2. So now the question, how do we uh, take out the information of B from this identity? And one key observation is that the B actually is totally independent of X. It only depends on three velocities. So that means even we choose the, the V depend on S, probably, probably it doesn't help much to recover the B. So this motivates us to just consider <clears throat> the solution V1, V2 only depend on the velocity. So now we fix a point, a vector V naught, and we choose this uh, special form we let the V2 is simply a constant and V1 is this uh, exponential function. And we substitute them into the identity. So they will much reduce the expression of the P. So the P now is simply independent of X and have these four exponential functions. And we also have the u prong, v prong, u and v in this volume. They all minus uh, the v naught, the fixed directions. Okay, so now the only thing that probably is to analyze uh, this p here and to see uh, if we can simplify it further. So remember, we have a two relationship that connects the uh, post collision u prong v prong and the pre collision u and v. And this is going to have a lot to reduce uh, this p. So recall we have the p in this form and uh, this, the third term and fourth, fourth term, they are already very simple, so we fix it. But the for the first exponential function, uh, this exponent by using the two relationship, by fixing the incoming velocity now is u and v naught. We can derive that this blue part 
will be a difference of these two terms. And the red part will be uh, expressed by the V naught U and W only. So in other words, we replace this blue part by these two terms and red part <clears throat> by this term here. And the third component now is one because we plug in the V replaced by V naught. So it's only one and the fourth term is the same. Then we will be able to factor it into of uh, these two terms. The first term is one minus exponential function with this negative exponent. And second term is the difference of this exponential function. But most importantly, the first term, this term is always less than or equal to one. So that means this term is less than or equal to zero. And similarly for here, because this is the branch of the factor u minus v naught. So uh, this is also uh, less than or equal to zero. So that imply the p will always be less than or equal to zero. And in particular, except to special direction of w, p will be always negative, okay? So why this is uh, crucial here? So now almost every point, the P is less than zero. If we go back to the identity derived by the key identity here, we have zero on the left, triple integral and negative P, almost every point. And now, so we just need to have some uh, assumption on the B in order to make sure this term must be zero. The, the condition uh, we assume is that the B satisfy the monotonicity condition. So the reason for that is to promise this term is always preserve the same sign for any vectors. And we know P is also preserving the same sign everywhere, almost everywhere. So that means this inner function in the integral is always preserving the same sign. They will promise that the B1, B2 must be uh, the same. So this is the uh, first unique result uh, directly by applying the key identity we discussed uh, previously. So now uh, the second part, we would like to uh, discuss the reconstruction formulas. So here we like to um, derive some formulas, they can uh, reconstruct the B. And this formula only depends on the known data, meaning that the formula only depends on the, uh, the, 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 in, the, the boundary measurements A. And to begin, we need to assume two additional assumptions. So B is symmetry in the incoming velocity. V and U, and B is also even function of the collision angle. <clears throat> and these two uh, assumptions is, is quite uh, natural in the physical sense. So this not, doesn't make uh, a lot of trouble here. So now uh, we know the B is only depend on the three velocity. It, it, it's independent of X. So it makes sense to consider our source term only depend on V as well. And to make sure S only depend on, uh, independent of S, <clears throat> we can do uh, like we did before to choose the transport solution V1 and V2, only depend on V, <clears throat> not depend on S. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, so now our source term, now we only depends on the velocity by choosing those, um, we transpose solution V1, V2 only depend on income, uh, the pre-collision and post-collision. And from the second initialization uh, equations, the W is equal to the nine integral of S. But now because S is independent of S, 
So the line integral will simply uh, equal to its exit time times the source. So if we assume the, uh, at least we know one position travel time, so we can determine the recovered SV at every V from the boundary major uh, map A. So from start from now, we will assume the S at every vector V is given. So how do we uh, recover the B? The strategy will be uh, very similar to, to the study of the RD equation we mentioned in the first part of the talk by applying some boundary data they are concentrated on certain points and directions. But in our case, we only need the directions. So we only focus our solutions like uh, the B1, V2. They are very free to choose because only satisfy the free transport equation. So we force these uh, two solutions. They are concentrated on the A point and B point direction. They are the uh, post collision vectors of A and B. And from this, we will be able to recover the B uh, kernel at A direction, V direction as the uh, pre collision vector and the collision angle up. So they'll be more clear by seeing these pictures. So to determine the kernel at one fixed W and A and B, is that we're choosing the free transport solution V1, V2 at this post collision velocity. Then we can determine every, uh, every single point uh, in the space of B. So by choosing a uh, very diff different V1, V2, we have the following uh, reconstruction formula depend on theta and theta per. So this is the reconstruction formula uh, in, in our work. So by choosing uh, A point, B point is the concentration angle uh, of the B1, V2. And uh, we have the S, the source term is known at the given velocity A. And we can uh, derive that this source term is equal to uh, this uh, term times the B at velocity A, B, uh, at theta, and also another term times the B at AB by his perpendicular directions. So in other words, we will be able to determine uh, the sum of these two terms by using the concentration uh, angle at A point and B point. So next slides, I would like to if we talk about two uh, unique results by using this uh, reconstruction formula. So I would like to point out that uh, the difference between this unique result and the, the earlier unique result is that during the derivation of the construction formula, which relies on uh, two astral condition, they are the B must be symmetry with respect to uh, the, the pre-collision velocity and you also need to be even function uh, of the W. So in this corollary, all we saw is that if we have a data and we can determine the B uniquely under the following two spatial cases. The first one, if we uh, assume the B is independent of collision angle, then uniquely result is fine. And second one, uh, if we assume the monotonicity condition, it will also hold. So uh, to see the first one, we assume the B is independent of the W. So that means uh, B only depend on the first uh, two, this uh, uh, pre-collision velocity. So that means if we go back to the formula, 
they will, these two terms will be the same. So they, they will promise that the B must be uh, a zero. So that's how we determine the B uniquely. But now if B is also depend on W, then we need to impose the uh, monotonicity conditions. So uh, from the formula, this is the formula we have. Because the data is the same, so the source will be also uh, the same. This is how we get zero on the left. And the right hand side, we can see uh, this magnitude will be always uh, uh, non-zero, uh, non-negative. Then we have the B1 minus B2 as well as here. So now if we uh, assume the monotonicity condition, and this again is to make sure the right hand side is two term follow the same sign. And that will force the B1 and B2 must be the same for every um, almost every point. And if B has sufficient regularity, they will be uh, the same at every point. So this is how we get the two unique results. Okay, so finally, let me uh, briefly, very briefly go through how we derive this reconstruction formula. So uh, what we did is we first pick three different uh, vectors, u naught, v naught, and v star. v star is some fixed point, fixed vectors, and u naught, v naught will be the concentration velocity for the solution v1 and v2. And this is fine because the, uh, as we mentioned earlier, this is the solution for free transpose equations. And then we can uh, uh, we can multiply the SV with the delta function. Uh, they focus on the V star, the fixed angle. Then we can decompose this S into the four terms. I1, I2, I3, and I4. So once we plug in those two delta function inside into our identity, what we get is now is we have two delta function respect to v prong u prong and also u prong v prong and u v uh, uh, v u and this is the full term we saw from the annihilations and now the additional term is multiplied with the delta function so now the only thing left is to analyze uh, the behavior of these three uh, of these four terms and because these three vectors, they are distinct. So that means we, if we look at, for example, the I3 term, then uh, we can, uh, because this delta function, we have du dv. So that means v and u can be taken at the vector v naught and u naught. So that means u naught is v naught. However, because we take the v naught is different from v star. So that means this term is actually uh, contributed uh, zero. So there will be zero for I3, same reason for I4. So these two terms actually makes no contribution. But for I1, I2, we perform the change of variables uh, to change it from du dv to u, du prong to dv prong. And then, uh, analyze it, we will be able to derive the following uh, terms. So for I1, we will have the, this function times the B at the fixed vector V start. And then the second vector now will be U na plus V na plus V start. And plus W1 will be the unit vector of V star minus, minus V naught. Similarly, for I2. And this is true, that's because they, we choose at the beginning, the three vectors are distinct. So finally, to get back to the, the form we, we see before, is we take the V star as A, and V naught is the A prong, and U naught is the B prong, just following the same notation before. So, we can derive this middle vectors in the B 
will be just uh, the B terms. And the W1 is a positive or minus uh, theta. And this is fine because we assume B is similar, uh, is even function in this direction. So either it's positive or minus, it makes no difference. So this is how we uh, get to uh, this formula uh, over here. And this is uh, a reconstruction formula for every points, every vectors at A, B, and theta. Under the two additional assumptions, B is even function, and also V is uh, uh, symmetry functions. All right, so lastly, I would like to uh, briefly mention what might be the a future uh, work we will consider. So first, uh, we would like to remove the monotonicity condition either here or in the, the first unique results. And we, 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 we really like to remove these conditions. And second, um, second uh, uh, portion we might reconsider is that uh, the model we consider is the Boltzmann equation. So let me go back. Yeah, so we, we consider the near Boltzmann equations, uh, but that'll be interesting to see if we impose uh, some similar like uh, assumption term here, like the plus sigma f, uh, can we still determine the k or even the, the, the sigma, the assumption coefficients? But one difficulty uh, I can think of right now is that the method we use here is we choosing the v, they are only independent, sorry. They are all independent of the position x. And, but if we include, uh, include uh, the sigma f into our equations, then during the annihilation, this v1 also need to satisfy the transport operator plus sigma u equals zero. And in that case, this choice might not work. So that will be an interesting question to consider at this these two uh, future works. So uh, this they will be all for my talk. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Rui, for the very nice talk. Thank you very much. Are there any qu questions or comments, please? Hello, uh, I have a question about uh, what's the boundary condition for the domain omega that has been the setup of the two cases? Uh, smooth. Uh, is that um, absorbing or reflective? Uh, it's not absorbing. Absorbing there will be zero, right? But we have the we have a boundary condition G on the incoming part. So I remember there was uh, inflow and the, the outflow. Yeah, that's a less inflow, yes. So it's not, it's not absorbing. So on one part of the domain, oh, sorry, on one part of our boundary is inflow boundary condition. And how about the part that you do the measurement? Yeah, they, they are all they are all I only draw the picture on one side, but actually they are the whole whole boundary. So it's inflow boundary condition for the entire domain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Sorry for the confusion. Yeah, no yeah they will be very, very more easy if I just draw, draw the one one side. Yeah. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments, please? Any other questions or comments, please? Sorry, I asked another question. Yeah. So here you are considering the steady state situation. Right. where there's no DFDT term, right? Right, right. Uh, have you and your collaborators think of, um, about what will happen or, uh, when, if there's like a DFDT term in the Boltzmann equation? Yeah, I, I think that will be a very interesting question. We haven't considered it, but I think that will be very interesting. Yeah, and uh, the flow will be more complicated because it might be uh, hit the boundary or just uh, hit in, inside the boundary, uh, yeah, inside yeah. the boundary. Yeah. 
Yes, yeah. So probably it's expected to be a little bit more difficult. Yeah, yeah. If we only talk about trajectory, there is already more complicated because can you add a, in, inside the domain or hit the, the boundary? So mm -hmm. yeah, it's expected to be more interesting, but of course it's, it will be more challenging. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments, please? Um, sorry, I, I just missed the previous question asked. Um, but uh, so it's possible I may be repeating it. Um, was, was the previous question about time dependence? Oh yeah, I think it's uh, you add the time dependence uh, partial t in the form. Okay, yeah. Yeah, there's a partial t. Um, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to say, I, I, I thought this was a very nice paper um, and I, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, Thank you, friends. Long time no see. Yeah. Uh, nice to see you again too. Um, yeah, and I was I was also just wondering um, if you're if you're interested in in other variations of this. Um, I was wondering um, because it, it seems like if you think about this as a tomography problem, what you're doing is you have maybe some sort of gas or something like this, and you're you're yeah. trying to probe um, with uh, I guess other gas particles um, and and sort of understand what your what the the parameters of your domain look like on the inside. Um, and I was wondering if if uh, if you thought of a case where um, uh, there's two different kind of particles. So you have the, the sort of native gas particles inside, and then you you have like um, other kinds of particles that you're observing with. Because um, I yeah. know that there's some people who work in kinetic equations that look at these kinds of um, variations in the Boltzmann equation where you have two different species of particles and they interact in different ways. Yeah, um, and they, they might have more complicated collision operator, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that will be very, very interesting. But uh, yeah, when we start this project because uh, this set us the more accessible. Right, right. right. Okay. Start from this work. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, even for the partial data problem, I think they'll be also very interesting. As I know you, you have some partial data for some chess point equation setting, right? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, uh, but because you're doing this, um. Uh, this higher order linearization, right? The, mm -hmm. I, um, is is the partial data version of this problem very very difficult? Or I don't know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah that was interesting. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you. Very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments, please? Any other questions or comments? Okay, if not, thank you very much, Rui, for the very nice talk. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.